It was September 3rd, 1821, and Michael Faraday came to the Royal Institution in the morning. To do, I imagine, simply some experiments in his laboratory. And in case you're wondering where that is, it's about 100 meters out and about 10 meters down, just that way. What he didn't know was by supper time, he would have invented the electric motor and have changed the world forever. Now, that wasn't the only great innovation of Michael Faraday. If you fast forward 10 years later in 1831, he also discovered magnetic induction. And that would lead us to electricity generation by mechanical means, both of which are the cornerstone of what I would say are modern daily lives. Today, what I want to do is take you through the journey that Michael Faraday has kindly left us in his own notebooks. And I want to talk a little bit about how this relates to today. Um, if you saw my quick video advertising this, you'll notice I mentioned the electric car. And if we take a look at the modern electric car, it's principally batteries and a motor. And if you weren't aware, that motor is the same apparatus that also generates electricity to recharge the batteries when you hit the brakes. The entire electric car is based upon this beautiful specimen here of an electric motor and an electric generator. That technology today comes all the way back to this place in 1821 and 1831, and that's what I'd like to share with you tonight. So I want to talk a little bit about what innovation is for a moment, because I think oftentimes we may struggle. I think everyone has perhaps a different definition for it. So I want to offer a very simple one for this evening. To me, innovation is about insights and value. And so we understand value, but what is insight? So for me, insight is about understanding things, understanding value that perhaps the user doesn't know, understanding value not seen by others, or in the case of Michael Faraday here, understanding solutions not considered or even imagined by others. And so our story starts with this gentleman, Michael Faraday. And I would like to first say that I am not a historian. I will do my best to represent all of the facts in the proper historical perspective. I am, as myself, an experimentalist. And so what I hope to share with you is that experimental journey that we're on. So the story goes that Michael Faraday, at age 15, borrowed a shilling from his brother to buy a glass jar because he had read how he could do electrostatic experiments by rubbing in a glass jar with leather. Is it true? Perhaps. It's a nice story. But more importantly, I think what is true is that it was clear early on Michael Faraday had a deep interest in science. Now, he apprenticed as a bookbinder, which itself was not a direct path to the scientific community. But he was keenly interested in those people speaking on science in London. Now, this is where the story begins, where Michael Faraday really truly shows his innovative spirit. So imagine you're an apprenticed bookbinder, and you would like to be one of the world's greatest scientists. And I just pause here a moment. I actually don't think that was Michael Faraday's goal. I think his goal was to participate and enjoy in the discovery of new knowledge. So how might you get from an apprentice of a bookbinder and then a bookbinder into a scientific career? Well, I'd like to take you to, and if we can switch to the demo camera, Ross, this book right here. So what Michael Faraday did is he attended some of the most famous scientists in the area. And what he would do is he'd write up notes on their lecture. And then he would carefully prepare a binded version and he would share it with the person. And he did this with Sir Humphrey Davy, who was at the RI and headed with the RI. He went to one of his talks, he wrote down copious notes, went home, and he wrote a book, a summary, and then he shared that with um, Sir Humphrey Davy. And I'm just gonna switch back to the book. So I told you this story if he prepared a book of notes and then he gave it to Sir Humphrey Davy. And I'd heard the story many times. What I'm about to show you shocked me when I saw it. This is the actual book that Faraday presented to Sir Humphrey Davy. 
looks just like a regular book until we get to pages such as this. This is all hand-drawn for the volume. So I just want you to notice the detail with which this is done. It is 291 pages handwritten. And in case you're wondering, yes, it does include hand-drawn illustrations of a fire. And then, of course, what book would be incomplete without a handmade index to show? I can imagine this took hundreds of hours of dedication by Michael Faraday for him to get the job he prized. Now, the story goes, as I understand, is he approached Sir Humphrey Davy and gave him this book to demonstrate his commitment. And to me, that sounded like a great story. But then I found out the truth is that Davy's assistant had been sacked the week before. There happened to be an opening, and Faraday showed up, and he said, sure, why not? So one of the stories we'll have throughout today is that sometimes serendipity is a bigger part of what we think it should be. All right, if we can go back to the slides. All right, fantastic. So now I would like to move to zeitgeist. How many of you have heard the word zeitgeist? It's the spirit of the times. And let's see if I can find the spirit in the camera. In 1820, there was the biggest revolution in electronic engineering possible. And this was because of one thing. Let's go back to the slides, Ross. Thanks. So it all comes down to this, the voltaic pile. Before the battery was invented, all the electricity that was ever known was static electricity. The battery is what has transformed physics and engineering in the early 1800s. And this was invented by uh, Alessandro Volta in 1799, I believe he published. This one here was a gift from Volta to Faraday himself in 1814, Charlotte? All right, I have an expert here in case I need to phone a friend in to get the correct advice. So this is really, if you wanted to know what enabled everything, was this battery. Now. At the time, batteries were the thing to have. So this is not in the Royal Institution, but this is the battery the Royal Institution had that was somewhere in the lower ground that they actually had to put together a subscription to have people pay for to have this battery. There was a gentleman over in France, Ampere. He took a month's wages to purchase one battery because that's how important this technology was. And I want to show you why this was so important. So first off, have we heard the saying by Pasteur, the chance favors the prepared mind? Yes? Do you know who he's referring to at the time? It was not general, it was very specific. It was Hans Christian Ersted. And I want to show you what he was able to do with this new technology of a battery. If we can go to the demo video. All right, so I have a loop of wire here, and I have a very modern AA battery. And I'm going to stick it in. And what he noticed was when he put what we would come to learn as current through a loop, it actually, do you see that needle move? And what, Amp, what Orsted did is Orsted noticed that a current carrying wire would affect a magnetic needle. He didn't know why. But this was the idea that transformed everything. The idea quickly went to France, to 1820, uh, to Ampere. And Ampere did the same experiments as Orsted, but he did something different. I just want you to watch. He actually took the compass and he went around the entire wire. And he actually went over the battery and noticed that everywhere in the loop, the compass needle was affected. Let's go to the slides for a moment. Everywhere in the loop, there was something flowing. And that is when Ampere introduced the idea of current. Now, it was interesting. He noticed that current flowed through the loop. But then he also noticed some interesting facts. Let's see if I can find some. I'll take out this 
this compass, this magnet right here. And you guys can just see down here. So I have current flowing through the loop. And he noticed that it was attracted and it was repelled. If I can get this over a little bit here, there we go. So it was repelled by this. That side is attracted. And so he noticed that the current carrying a loop created a magnetic field and it would react to a magnetic field. Now at the time, the world's largest magnetic field was the Earth's. And he said, in the span of a week, what if the Earth's magnetic field is just from a current running around inside of the Earth? And in fact, to today, all of the magnetic fields we describe are in relation to simply a current revolving around a wire. Now, this was a great discovery of Ampere's, this connection between magnetism, but Ampere was very traditional. He was a traditional scientist, if you will. And I think what I'd like to do now is I'd like to ask, could I have a volunteer come up? Do I have a volunteer? Yes, do you wanna come up right here? You right there? You wanna come on up? Yes, please, come on up. Come on down. All right, you are the average scientist in 1820, okay? Will you do some demonstrations with me? Okay, all right, let's take this. I have one of these, okay, let's put it together. How would you describe what just happened? Okay, well, no, don't turn yours around. If you turn yours around, I can't turn mine around. Now, what does that do? Fantastic, we're not done, okay? Uh, just a quick question. If I were to drop this, what would happen? It would drop, okay. What direction does it drop? Straight down, right? Whoops. Let's not break our apparatus. Does it do twirls in the air and fly to the right, to the left? No, it goes straight down. Okay. When we described this attraction and repulsion, it was kind of like direct, right? Okay. All right. Now, um, if you would stand so close, I want you just to describe this. I'm going to create a little static electricity. And I want you to tell me what you see. Maybe we, you can come on this side. I'll come on that side. Maybe you can tell me what you can see as I bring it close to this a little bit of foil. What's it doing? It's attracted, is it not? It is. Attracting. It's attracting, and it's attracting in a direct straight line, yes? Okay, we have one last one that I would like your esteemed advice on. All right, so I'm just going to turn on my little experiment right here. So these are just two coils, and this was one of Ampere's famous experiments. The coils create a magnetic field. Let's see what we can do here. What are they doing? Okay, and if I turn it around, attracting. attracting. In a straight line? Yeah. Okay, I'll just do this again. Okay, all right. So everything we've seen, forces, great, electricity, gravity, magnetism, everything in a straight line. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. So this is the world as it was in 1820. So now enters Faraday. So by the way, Ampere did all of his work defining where the Earth's magnetic field comes, defining what current is, defining these coils that attract and repel one another. All of this before Faraday even started. And in 1821, Faraday was asked by one of the editors here of their journal if he wouldn't mind writing up a summary of the work that everyone has done. And so Ampere, I'm sorry, Faraday went out and he got the papers of Ampere, he got the papers of Orsted, and he wrote a very famous paper called The Historical Sketch of Electromagnetism. Now, do you notice his name is not below the title? He did not author this, or I'm sorry, he did not sign his name to this. I don't know whether this was because he didn't feel confident enough, or this was because he wasn't sure where it was headed, but he summarized all of the world's work and I want to look at a very close place because what we are doing is we're understanding where the world was before Faraday started his work. And if we zoom in here, what do you see in the figure on the right? You see the words attraction, repel, right? The same thing the young gentleman helped me with here. We have this attraction, we have this repulsion. At this time in the world, the entire domain of physics was understood as action at a distance of direct forces. Gravity, magnetism, electrostatic, we just saw them all. They were direct forces, and this is exactly what Ampere and all of the scientists, particularly in France, understood the world to be. 
And I want to show you something, or actually do play something for you. And I want to tell me if you can understand this. I want to play it one more time, see if I can get it to go. All right, can anybody understand that? Don't tell us what it is. A few can, they think. All right, this is how the world appeared to everyone else in 1821 before Faraday started his work. We're going to come back and find out what that was all about. All right, so here we are, September 3rd, 1821, 9 a.m. You know, I think Faraday probably came in a little earlier than that, but for this story, we're going to start at 9 a.m. All right, so what we want to do is uh, we're going to go to the demo cameras. So I'm going to remove Davy's notebook, and I'm going to pull out Michael Faraday's notebook from 1821. I'm going to turn to September 3rd. And here we are, I just want to make sure we can all see it. If you can see right up here, 1821, September 3rd, right there. And he started with some experiments that I'm going to repeat for you right here. And I think if we go to this one, this will probably be the best. All right, fantastic. So what I have here is I have just a magnetic needle that I've created. And I'm going to hook up my apparatus. There we go. To here, and then to here. All right, let's see if I can just get this to. I will steal a piece of tape just to make sure this stays in the right place. There we go. All right, let's get that set up. Okay. All right. So that was not what we wanted to happen at this moment, but we'll see if we can get it to work in any way. OK, so here we are. We've got our little piece here. So what I've got is I've got a current carrying wire. Let's see if we'll find out whether it hooks back up. That's fantastic. OK, so I have a current carrying wire here. And the first thing that any good scientist would do is Faraday simply comes in, and he notices that the, I'll just turn this away. And when we turn on the current, you can see the needle move a little bit. And he repeated Orsted's experiment, noticing that the needle was greatly affected. Then what he did is he just took this little magnetic needle here, and he started to notice that it kind of touched. Now, I want you to notice really closely. Let's see if I can get this a little bit better. Do you notice that when it comes to rest, it doesn't rest at the end. It rests a little bit in, right? If I go back to the other side, once again, it doesn't rest at the end. It's not attracted at the end, it's attracted. And in fact, if I pull it to the end, look at that. Let's go look at that again. So here I am. All I'm going to do is pull it back until it gets to the very end. And did you see it was repelled? Did you see that? I can go do it on the other side. I pull it back, and then it's repelled. So this is very interesting. Let's go to the slides. And let's just work back here real quick. We don't have to listen to that. Let's look at this. This said the end was attracted and repelled, and that was it. But what Michael Faraday realized as he was doing this experiment is that things were quite different. And in fact, let's go take a look at, we'll look at the demo uh, cameras. Let's go back and look at his book, his notebook here. And if we look at it, if you can see right here, it says strongly attracted, repulsion, attraction, repulsion. And what he's noticing is exactly what I showed you, that it wasn't as simple as he saw it before. It wasn't that the end was repelled or attracted. It was the end was repulsed, but just before it, it was attracted. And this was very odd, because everything up to this point was simply I'm attracted or repelled, nothing more complicated than that. And so he tried to sort of understand this idea that things weren't as simple as Ampere had made them out to be. So let's go back to our slides real quick. So this is where I think uh, Faraday started to have his insight. He started to understand something that no one else had seen. Now, I want to be clear. People have been looking at this experiment for five, six years, and no one had noticed this but Michael Faraday. And this really was a starting point for his morning that would change the world. 
So we move forward to 11 a.m. And um, I want to talk about something before we get into the next demonstration. And that is, why are new ideas hard? Okay. So I have a couple examples here I want to use with this. So uh, for this one, I need a volunteer. I need anyone volunteer. Um, I actually would prefer an adult volunteer for this one. And I will explain why in a moment. Here we go. Can you stand up and come on up front? There we go. All right. Uh, you speak English? Yes. Fantastic. OK. Uh, do you speak American? Sometimes. OK, that's all right. OK, that's good. So um, my daughter knew I was coming to give a talk today. And she always likes to write little notes to my audience. But she always writes it in a coat. So I have her code on the next one, and I'd like you to read it out loud. Let's just test your mic, make sure it works for you. Hello? Hello, it works great. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to read it out loud, and you have to read it out loud for everyone, okay? okay. All right, and you guys can just read along as we go. One hope. Nope, start at the very top, uh, if you could. D's three, four, R, R, Roy, four, L, D. Do, uh, do you want to, does it, does it make you think of a word? Yeah, Why don't you back up a little bit? Can I just there read it? Yeah. Okay. Dear Royal Institution, I hope you are having for great evening. I hope I got this name right. My dad says <laughs> it rhymes with constitution. I know my dad is excited to be speaking with you. He knows for a lot about innovation and I hope he can share some insights with everyone, this, everyone there. I hope all of you will, be, will do great things, amazing things. By now, your mind is reading this automatically without even thinking about it. <laughs> I knew you could do it. <laughs> Sincerely. <laughs> Julia. Julia. All right, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, so he struggled a little bit, but then he was fine. How is it he's able to read something that has so many, if you will, errors or is written in a code? It's because... He's not actually reading the words. The words are already in his head. And when we read, we think we're taking what's on the page and we're putting it in our head, but really everything's already in our head. And that is the challenge for innovation and creativity is how do we create new thoughts when really our perception of the world is stuck inside? And I'd like to do one more example with you here. So this was given to me by my brother. He said this was sent to uh, his son when he was eight. And it says, write the following words in alphabetical order, the order they come in the alphabet. Uh, and we have A, B, C through X. The missing letters of Y and Z are not significant here. So we've got apple, pumpkin, log, river, fox, pond. Now, I want you to take a look at this. And you don't have a sheet of paper, but try to just pick out the first couple words you think uh, to write the following words in alphabetical order. All right? So pick the first one. I think it's kind of easy to find that one, right? And maybe you can think of the second one or third one. You got a couple in your minds? OK? So here is the answer I put down. Does this match what you guys had? Yeah, that's great. And then my brother sent me a solution that one student submitted, which is this. Now, if you know what happened here, just kind of raise your hand a little bit. All right. I had to go ask my mother how this was done. And if you're like me and you're struggling a little bit, I'll do a slower version, not a simpler version for you. Why don't you write the following word in alphabetical order? A-P-P-L-E. A-E-L-P-P. -P. Now, why am I sharing this with you? It's because you all read the directions and assumed one thing, and this student read them and saw them differently, right? And that's what they actually saw on all of these, differently. And so this is the challenge in innovation, is to come up with new ideas when we all see the same things. For five years, everyone saw that little needle and said it attracts or repels. And Michael Faraday said, wait a minute. It attracts kind of a bit in, but at the very end, it repels. Something, something more complicated is going on here. And so what he did is he reframed the problem, which is something very traditional in innovation. And I want to show you what he did. Uh, let's go to the demo cameras. OK. So let's see if we can take a look. If you can see right here. So what he said is he plotted out in the previous in his notebooks, he plotted out all the motions of the needles. And then he said, OK, that was a needle going around a wire. Then he had a what we call a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment. He said, OK, 
What would a wire do around a needle? And that's a very interesting question. And this was the giant leap, or one of the giant leaps of the day. So you may have trouble envisioning this is it going around right here. So what I want to do is I just want to do that experiment for you here. Not a thought experiment, but an actual experiment. And let's see if I can switch over to... We'll get the right one here eventually. That is perfect. Okay, so what I have here is I have a wire, and you can notice it's wobbly, right? And the purpose of that is I want to be able to see how it moves around a wire. Okay, it's a little bit moving. There we go. All right. So now we have a magnetic needle right here. It's fantastic. Um, a bar magnet is just a bigger version of that. There's a north pole, there's a south pole, so nothing's really different here. All right, so we can see that pretty well. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn up the... And by the way, all I'm doing here is connecting my battery, just like they used to do. All right, now let's just see. I'm going to put up my magnet to, oh, let's put this over here. It goes there. Let's see if I can do this. I'm going to put my magnet on this side. Notice what it does. Did you see that? What does it do? It goes around the pole. Do you notice it starts on this side, right? And it goes around. Now I'm going to go back with the other pole. And let's see if we can get it to go back the other way. I think it would do it. There we go. It went around again. Just want to make sure we can see this. You know what? I'm going to tilt this down a little bit. Hey, that's better. OK, so there it is. So I'm on this side. Now watch it. I'm creeping up. Do you see that? It's super quick, right? Everybody see that? It moves around the pole. It's so strong. It moves around the pole. Now, the young gentleman who was here to help me earlier, what's your name? What's that again? Ari. Ari Hend. He came down and he said, right, he was the, the consummate 1820s physicist, right? Everything was static electricity, it attracted. Coils, they attracted. Magnets, they attracted. Things that fell from the earth down, attracted straight. Everything was direct. Nothing in the physical world went around anything. And yet Michael Faraday, with his Gedanken experiment, said, I think I've seen something entirely new. Let's go back to his book here, in right here. So that was the second step. That was one of the start of the big leaps of his day. Let's go back to the slides for a second. We gotta go there. So he reframed the problem, right? Instead of thinking about the needle going around the wire, he thought about the wire going around the needle and came up with the first I wouldn't say the first idea, because there's a bit of a disagreement in history on whether the rotation was his idea or he heard it from someone else, but certainly that experiment was Faraday's. All right. Now, we heard this before. I'm going to play it one more time. And this is how Faraday started the day, a bit confused. And now, this is what happened around 11. So I can get it to play. Celebrating 200 years of the electric motor at the Royal Institution. We'll just listen to that one more time. Celebrating 200 years of the electric motor at the Royal Institution. Now let's listen to the exact same thing we heard before we had the understanding of what it meant. How many of you heard that? I'll play it one more time, right? So this, I love, is just an example of the fact that we saw or heard in this example exactly the same thing before and after. But before we understood what it meant, it made no sense. And for Faraday, this is what it was. He had the idea of this rotation around a pole. And I just, well, this gives me a feeling for what it must have felt like to be looking at everything one way, interaction, straight lines, and suddenly this idea of a rotation comes up. All right. 2 p.m. I don't know whether he had lunch or not, but that's regardless. He, maybe he worked through. And um, so a key part of innovation that we talk about in modern times is prototyping. And I want to share with you my favorite example of a modern prototype for innovation is this. I don't know if you've seen this. This is on Twitter. So this was a grandma had difficulty using her remote for the telly. And so her daughter uh, took it and just put post-it notes around it and wrote little labels on it so she'd understand. So it was the idea of, you're having a problem, I want to try out something, I'm going to try it out real quick. 
And now you're thinking, what does this have to do with Michael Faraday? Well, let's take a look at the demo camera again. And it's kind of hard to see, but if you look right here, you see this little shape? It's kind of a crank. So what Faraday did is he just took a piece of wire and he shaped it in the shape of this crank. And his thought was, well, if this wire goes around this, maybe I could get this to go around a magnet, right? If this wire was trying to go around, what happens? It goes around, you know what, let's, uh, let's go to this one. That'll be much better, fantastic. So when we have our wire, uh, it goes around, right? But it hits, right? So his idea was maybe I could build something that could rotate around, and maybe if I pulled it out of the way, it would continue to rotate. This is just a prototype of moving on for the wire. And let's see if we can actually do this with our demonstration right here. Okay, so there we are. And I just want to mention this is not how he built it. I think we want to go to the forward-facing camera for this one. This is not how he built it. Um, and that's because he used mercury and a lot of environmentally unfriendly, so I had to build something a little bit more environmentally friendly here. And we're going to just turn this up right there. There we go. And let's see if I can get this to rotate. And by the way, I'm fiddling with my fingers to get it to uh, have at the least friction possible. You can see it kind of rotate. I'm going to, there we go. And I'm going to try to get it where I can get it to come around without me rotating. You see that? So it's coming around, and I just get my magnet out of the way, and it lets me rotate around in the circle. And so one last time, to see, there we go. It's a little bit finicky. There we go. All right, this is the part of the demo that always has a little bit of difficulty. But you can see it's rotating around the pole of the magnet. And this was the big idea. If we can go back to the slides. That was it. That was his big idea, his insight that it revolves around the pole. He built a crank. And all he wanted to realize was, oh, well, I keep on having to pull it out. Maybe what I'll do is I'll just set it down, and then the wire can revolve around, and I don't have to move it in and out. And that's exactly what he did for at 5 p.m. that day, is he simply said, let me take my crank out, straighten it out. That's what this was here. And now it's just going to revolve around the pole of a magnet. There really is no inventive step from here to here. The idea was revolving around the pole. And so now let's just move this over to this final one. And this one hopefully will behave for us, but maybe not. This one takes a little bit of a step. And I think I want to be, yeah, we have the front camera. Let's see if we can get it to move. Now we got a little bit of movement there. All right, I am helping it along a little bit here, but you can see it starts to rotate around. And once again, he used mercury. I'm trying not to do that for environmental reasons. But um, what I will do is I will actually, let's see if we can get this one last time. Aha, I have found the source of the problem. I have unhooked it. What, what's that? Oh, yeah, sorry, Ross, can we cut to the camera? I apologize. I thought that was already there. OK, let's see if we can get this. Can we get this to go around? Now I see what's happening here. Well, it's not a good demo without a spark. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to just move this over here. And I have a nice little backup that I have built. So let's take a look at right there. So what I have is a magnet. And then I have a little wire set above the magnet. And then I have a nice 9-volt battery. There we go. And now we can see the rotation around, all right? So that was what, at 5 p.m., he had done. He had gone through noticing the attraction and repulsion was very different than everyone thought before. The wire moves around the pole, and then we end up here with his final motor 
And there we go. And that was the invention of the day. So that was what he accomplished in one day. Let's go back to the slides for a moment. And so when we talk about innovation, we talked about insight plus value. I want to address one important issue about Michael Faraday. A lot of people tell me, well, you know, I've heard that Michael Faraday was just a scientist and he was just focused on science. He wasn't interested in industry, commercial value. And when we think about innovation, a lot of times we think about big companies, big commercial value. But I think Michael Faraday had a different value proposition. For him, it was all about how do we make physics, the natural world, seeable to everyone. And that's really what I think Michael Faraday's life works in generating value for society was, well, not just the scientific aspect, but also the 40 years he dedicated lecturing here at the Royal Institution and creating visible uh, artifacts for us to look at. And just as one of these examples here, this is a small tube, I think it's about one or two centimeters tall, that he made, an electric motor, and he sent it to all the scientists in Europe to communicate about this new discovery. Now, everyone up to this point, all the great scientists in the world, had no idea that this was even possible, let alone how it worked. So I want you to take a look at this. This is all the scientists' brains beforehand. And then suddenly you see this. All right. And then we go back, and you all see this is here. So this is what happened with this. Michael Faraday sent this around the world, and everyone all of a sudden suddenly knew how to make an electric motor. And what I'd like to do for you today is just show you really quick Faraday's motor that inspired Ampere's motor that inspired Davy's motor. So we're going to start with Faraday's motor. Um, and I think we're going to go to camera two. No, they we're on the right camera there. All right, so let's see if I can do this. So this is the very popular homopolar motor, which you've probably seen. And you can tell it's very much exactly the same as here. It's simply a wire revolving around a magnet down here on the bottom. So this was Faraday's nice little motor that we redo here at the, um, uh, at the Royal Institution quite a bit. Now, Ampere got a hold of Faraday's paper, and he said, aha, you can't, can't have the only motor. And so what Ampere did is he created a different motor, same exact physical principles. I'm going to see if I can get this in front of the camera there. There we go. Are you ready for this? Watch it spin. You see that? And all of these motors work in the same way. There's a current flowing through a wire that intersects with a magnetic field to create a perpendicular torque. So this was Ampere's motor. And now I'm going to switch to, sorry, let's see, switch to three. That means nothing to you, I realize that, but hopefully. Um, and now we're going to do Davy's motor. How many of you have been on YouTube and heard about the Mercury Vortex? No one? All right. After this, Google the Mercury Vortex. So what we have here is I have a simple magnet. And um, I'm going to see if I can figure out how to adjust this. Tom, the um, end of this lead came off. That's OK, though. I can do this demo without it. So. By the way, all that's in here is uh, sodium bicarbonate. I think that's right. And let's see if I can do this. You guys see a twirl? There you go. There you go. And all this is is the liquid is revolving around the magnet because the current is flowing through the liquid. And this was a motor that Davy created for, uh, to show that he was also pretty bright himself. <laughs> so as you can see from all of these, these are the immediate. And when I say immediate, all of these motors followed within months of Faraday shipping out his small little motor. All right, we are going to take these away. And um, Mike, I think, is going to repair my little thing over here. Great. So now what we're going to do is we're going to roll out the next demo, which I'll just pull out here. All right, so the problem with magnets is they're always calling a problem. So we talked about serendipity before, and it turned out some people had built compasses and put them in boxes. Now you're saying, well, that doesn't sound very interesting that they put them in boxes. Okay. There we go. 
I think I can get this right. So what they did is they put a compass in a copper box. This is aluminum here. And they put a compass in a wooden box. And let's just take a look here. I'm going to spin these two. I'm just going to go ahead and spin this one. And it's going to spin forever. What's that? It's OK, but I think you guys can see it from, the, from there. I don't think we need the camera for this one. All right, now what I'm going to do is flick this one. And I'm just going to bring this up a little higher. So let's just do that really again to start them at the same time. I'm going to flick that one. Flick it hard. That was really hard. I'm going to flick this one hard. You notice how this one stops. So what they learned was that if a magnet moves next to a metal, there was some kind of interaction. And you've probably seen this demonstration on maybe in your physics class or maybe someplace else. So what I have here is just two magnetic balls, and I have a copper tube. Have you seen this one here? So I just drop it in, scratch my head, and then I go down here to pick it up. All right? So what's happening is the movement of the magnet is doing something that is creating currents, that is creating a force. And this was, Arago was the first one to publish on it, but this was, by the way, you can see it's still swinging. This was what led Ampere and Faraday to the idea that currents and electricity could interact. And it's what led him to the idea of magnetic induction. All right, so I have here, um, unlike the book where he stepped through all the steps of the day of September 3rd, for induction, he did not. And I think the reason is it probably happened over a decade of him trying experiments. In fact, if you look in his notebooks, every three or four years, he's trying another induction experiment to try to understand what is going on. And so what I have right here is the actual induction ring that Michael Faraday used to demonstrate magnetic induction. And it was based upon this intuition that everybody had learned that magnets, moving magnets, have some effect with metals. They're not sure what it was. And um, with this one right here, I think Charlotte has told me it took Faraday 10 days to hand wind this coil. And all this is is an iron ring. This is a reproduction where you have hand wound about 100 to 150 feet. Yes, they used feet back then, uh, for my sake, uh, on each side of wire that was insulated. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the magic of magnetic induction. This was the exact experiment that Faraday did. He just hooked one end up to a battery, and there you go. You guys don't seem very interested in my battery. Do we have it up there? Oh, let's move this back over here. All right, you guys don't? All right, here we go. Let's do it again. You, you guys still don't see. I'll give you a secret. It's not going to help. What do you guys think? Is that very exciting? No, Faraday didn't think so either. Um, aha, here we go. I forgot this important piece. OK, so yeah, let's, <laughs> let's attach this. And so what Faraday did was he attached a battery, the famous battery we've heard about, to this coil. And we should see, did you see it move? OK. So what he noticed was, now notice, I hold it there, and it comes back. It was only in connecting and disconnecting. It was only the movement. It was only the change that caused Magnetic induction. Now, at the time, everyone understood that magnets could be replaced by current carrying wires. So here I had a battery. Now what I'm going to do is try my magnet. See that? Move it away, move it towards. Move it away, move it towards. And so this is the experiment that Michael Faraday did that demonstrated induction. And this is how electricity is generated. We take a magnetic field, and we actually apply it to a coil to generate electricity. Now, we have this here. And this, by the way, wasn't very satisfying to Michael Faraday. This was not sort of the epitome of science demonstration. It wasn't that interesting. So I think we want to do is I think we want to do is we want to try an experiment that Michael Faraday did. And let me go to the book. And do you want to swap out the apparatus, Tom? So here is a later volume of Michael Faraday's book. And if I have any luck, so first off, here is the actual, I got it, Charlotte, don't worry. 
We have the actual ring experiment right here. But what I want you to do is I want to turn a little bit, turn a little bit to this right here. Now, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to clear everything off we possibly can. I'm going to put everything over here. And I'll just toss these on the floor. So the following experiment we are going to do was an experiment that Michael Faraday described in his own words as, hold on while we clear off the, the, uh, the demo table here. Before we do this, before we do the experiment, I almost forgot I need another volunteer. Can I have another volunteer? Uh, let's go, do we have, nobody, nope. Yes, okay, we've got somebody on this side, come on down. All right. All right, are you familiar with the compass? Um, yes or no? Yes. yes? Okay. Can you tell me, do you know what the red points to? North. It points to north, okay? So that's the direction of the magnetic field. Now, I've got my cute little stick here. Can you point my stick to where north is? Can you go ahead and point it? Here's the compass. Go ahead, try it. No? Almost, 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 almost. There you go. I think that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So that's where north is. That's where the magnetic field goes. You're almost 100% correct, except for that. You had the right direction. Did you know the magnetic field in London goes straight down into the Earth? It does. All right, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. So all we need to do is, let's go back. Are we on? Yes, demo camera one. Let's take a look at a iron filing. I want to do this in the proper order. So I want to put my book away. And I want to bring out the iron filing demonstration. Let's see if we can see this. Can you see there's two disks? Do you notice how the iron filings curve around to go in? Can you see that? I'll bring it up a little bit. There we go. You see that now? So the magnetic field of the Earth starts on the South Pole comes directly out of the South Pole, curves around the entire planet, and then goes back into the North Pole. And here in London, it points down. So Michael Faraday realized that the magnetic field of the Earth, one, it was one of the largest magnets they had, but it was also, to him, one of the best ways to visualize nature in its raw state. And that's when he did the following um, uh, demonstration. So let me just set this over here. Thomas, I think I'm going to need your help in getting this to the right camera, wherever that might be. Uh, it is. There we go. And I think we're going to also need to take the demo camera away. We don't need the demo camera for this. There we are. Just going to move that out of the way here. And the reason I'm being so careful with everything is... Perfect. All right, so what we're going to do is I have here my spaghetti. So this was further on in Michael Faraday's um, material. But one of the things he discovered was that you generate electric currents when you cut the magnetic field. So that was the verb he used. So I have here the spaghetti, which if it was perfectly proper would point in the same direction as the Earth's magnetic field right now. And what we're going to do is we are going to take an eight-foot loop of wire, exactly as Faraday did, and we are simply going to rotate it in the Earth's magnetic field to generate electricity. And my hope is that we will generate electricity. So let's see if we can do the demo first, and then I'll explain a little bit more here. So let's see what we got in there. Did we get anything? We don't have anything. Oh, there we go. Did you see that? Was, was that positive or negative? That was negative, all right? So I do it over here. I get plus two. I do it over here, I get minus two, you see that? So I cut this way, I generate electricity plus two, I cut this way, I generate electricity minus two. Now when I say cut, cut means I'm crossing the magnetic field. So when we did the battery, we made the uh, magnetic field come big and small, here we're just cutting the field. If I just go up and down, would I cut across the spaghetti? No. So let's do that experiment. There's no generation of electricity. It's only when we cross the magnetic field 
do we get the generation of electricity? And it's easily demonstrated here because of where the magnetic field is. Now, I want to share with you how Michael Faraday felt about that experiment. We should have back to the book here. So if I go back to here, and I go through to the end, and there we go. So we go to our bookmarks, our bookmarks. All right, there we go. All right, let's see if we can see. Can you see right here, this is the experiment I just did. It's kind of hard to see, I'll lift it up a little bit. So you can see it. Can anybody see the word right next to it? Can anybody see this word right here? It's kind of hard to read his writing. His simple description of the experiment was beautiful, underlined. So that was really the genius of Michael Faraday, was his ability to find the simplest way to explain the physical world that we have. And um, I would like to finish with um, one last demonstration. So from these two phenomena, he generated the electric motor and the generation of electricity that drives everything we do today, literally and figuratively. However, there is one demonstration that has vexed me for almost six months, and I'm hoping that I can do it here. And this was December 25th, 1821. Michael Faraday, not satisfied that he created an electric motor. Actually, he sent his motor to Ampere, and Ampere wrote back and said, you think you're so smart, Faraday. I think you can make one that turns in the Earth's magnetic field. And, of course, Faraday took up the challenge. And December 25th, 1821. So if I go there. All right, this is great. Can you guys see this? See this little diagram right here? So this is all Michael left me for instructions. <laughs> A banana, okay? And what Michael said was, you can build one of my motors in the Earth's magnetic field, but you have to have the wires be at an angle to the magnetic field. It is actually the crossing of the fields that creates the force. And so what we did here is we have created, let's go to this camera right here, which is probably four. So what I have right here, uh, let's see if we can go to four. There we go. And here we are. Oh, stop. There you go. Don't worry, it is, I'll just leave it down for a second. So um, this demonstration, as far as I know, has not been done in the last 200 years. Uh, it was never done publicly uh, at the Royal Institution, and I'm hoping I can get it to work here. And what we're going to have is we have a current carrying wire in the center. It's just like the little angle we had before on our motor that was sitting here. I have four just to give it a little extra kick. Um, and if you notice, there is no magnetic. There's no magnet inside as we had before. So um, why don't you go ahead and, yes, why don't I, to do this, I have to be safe. So I go over here. And it is my pleasure to put on the Royal Institution coat. And just a moment. Okay, and here we go, my goggles. All right, are we on the right camera? We are, you guys can see that, very great. All right, Thomas, can you go ahead and attach the two leads? And the black goes on, nope, yeah. By the way, that's why it took me six months to be able to do this, okay. Okay, just a second. Okay. All right, let me go over and see if I can do it. No, you had it there, I think it was. Oh my goodness, no, let's give it a little kick. I think it actually. Hold on a second, don't, don't trust me until I actually get it to rotate. All right. And I'm sorry, my friends, sometimes that's as slow as it goes. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can get it over just a little bit. Let's see if I can get a little kick. About that. All 
There we go. And there we have the demonstration that hasn't been here for 200 years, the rotation in the Earth's magnetic field. So why was it that Michael Faraday was so successful in innovation? If you want to go back to the slides. It's because I think there's a couple things. One is he was not educated in the traditional means. Everyone in France was taught action at a distance. This idea that everything had to be direct line was not something that people, that Faraday even knew. If you didn't know, Michael Faraday did no maths. There's no equations in any of the notebooks. He was somebody who taught himself. He was very creative. He had a great deal of insight. He saw things that other people didn't see. He created prototypes to be able to test out new ideas. He reframed problems in order to find new solutions and new understanding. And as we say in Boston, he was also wicked smart. So uh, that is the innovative process of Michael Faraday. I hope you've enjoyed these demonstrations tonight.